What I'm going to do is I'll just speak. I don't want to stand between you and afternoon tea, and it is the afternoon session. So what I thought I'd do is I would just speak maybe for 15, 20 minutes, and then we'll have um, time for discussion. It struck me that when David said, let's uh, talk about wokery, let's talk about the future of Western civilization, that we've all written our papers separately. But isn't it interesting? They have all devolved towards education. And as it happens, that's exactly what I'm going to be talking about uh, in the next 20 minutes. As Kevin said, my background is actually not in education as a teacher, but in education policy, having worked in the Kennett government in Victoria as a senior advisor. I was a chief of staff to David Kemp, the education minister in the Howard government. Um, at the Menzies Research Centre with the Liberal Party think tank, I uh, work with Professor Brian Caldwell, who was Dean of Education at uh, the University of Melbourne. So I've had a, a passion for education for many years. Three children now nearly through the uh, uh, Catholic education system. Uh, and what I'll talk about is from my experience of public policy over the last 35 years, everything comes back to education and uh, young people. So Kevin mentioned um, the phrase that he's working on lighting small fires. And as I said, after my decades of experience in public policy, that's what we must do. The idea that we can undertake system-wide change, the idea that we can recapture our institutions, I don't think is feasible anymore. So what I'm going to talk about is not the fact that we are losing our battle for freedom. We have lost our battle for freedom. We have to understand this. We have to regroup. We have to understand why we have lost and we have to understand what we will now do to regain our own freedom and the freedom of the rest of the community. So when Kevin mentioned lighting small fires, I'm, I was reminded of a lovely quote by Charles Handy about doing what we can do when we can do it. We cannot wait for great visions from great people for they are in short supply it is up to us to light our own small fires in the darkness. And we can do that by teaching and educating and uh, inculcating values of Western civilization to every young person as we can. So I'll talk um, very briefly about what I think is the um, public policy perspectives on our freedom. And then, as it happened, I'll talk about education uh, and I'll give some real life examples of what has actually happened and why we have lost because I think we can often talk about this having happened or this not having happened or we can make vague references to ACARA and the national curriculum but what I uh, will do is give some specific references. Um, so the first point to make is that we have to understand we are less free in Australia right now, 2020-23, than at any time in living memory. Our freedom of speech is under assault, our freedom of religion is under assault, our freedom of association is under assault, and we have to understand this. For someone like me, we tend to think, well, it will pass. Well, it won't actually pass and it hasn't passed. We tend to think, well, the pendulum will swing back. And as a Victorian Liberal, uh, member of the Liberal Party, <laughs> now polling on 23%, holding 18 out of 88 seats in the lower house, uh, there's no indication any pendulum is swinging back anytime soon. Um, and again, in a political context, uh, if we're focused on political parties, and I'll come to political parties in a moment, um, what I say as a Victorian is, why do the Victorian Liberals assume the pendulum will swing back? Why will we not end up like a Republican in California or a Republican in Manhattan? So that's one of the points that 
I want to make. And I think we have to understand, as much as we would like to go back to a period of fond memory, let's say 2010, <laughs> let's say Cathy Freeman winning the Sydney, winning the 400 metres at the Sydney Olympics. We can't. It has gone too far. In my experience at the IPA, talking to our 8,000 members, which is an absolute um, cross-section of mainstream Australia, um, the feeling of our members, my feeling, feeling of people in my church, is that this has happened so quickly. It has happened before our eyes. I remember writing in my column in the Financial Review about the Archbishop standing up for freedom of religion. I remember writing about the fact that I never thought I would have to be arguing that. And I remember writing that I never thought I would be having to convince politicians, Labor or Liberal, because there's some, you know, there some bad Liberal politicians and there's some good Labor politicians, but trying to convince them that this is an absolute point of principle. And when people ask me what has happened, I come back, and, Ch and Chesterton has been mentioned already a few times today, the famous Chesterton line, and there are so many, if you are not constantly painting a black, a white post black, it, oh, a black post white, it will turn black. We have forgotten how to renew, we have forgotten that we are in a battle for our culture and we have lost the terminology to debate that. We have assumed too much. We have assumed that freedom and human flourishing is the natural way and it isn't and we have forgotten Ronald Reagan's great declaration that every generation has to fight for its own freedom. We have rested on our laurels and we have forgotten that civilizations collapse from within. That is what has happened to us. So I would love to be able to say we will recapture the universities, we will recapture civil society, or not even recapture them, we'll get to a debate, a position where there is a 50-50 debate. We are too far gone. There is no evidence that such a strategy will ever work. Um, the powers of critical studies, the powers of identity politics, the powers of cancel culture are now too strong. Uh, they have too much of an adherence from too many people. Um, and we have to understand we are now the heretics. We are now the dissidents. We are now, and, and some of you would know Toby Young, the founder of the Free Speech Union in the UK, um, and a, a great fighter for freedom of speech, freedom of religion. We are, and he, I interviewed him uh, a couple of years ago. He said, we are now the Viet Cong. Uh, we are the people uh, who must retreat, regroup, rebuild, reassess. The fact that we once might have held the commanding heights, or not even held the commanding heights, but we um, might once have had parity with um, those who wish to strike down our civilization we have to understand is no longer the case. So this has happened, as I said, because we've rested on our laurels. I think, and I taught politics at the University of Melbourne for a number of years, I think there are uniquely Australian situations or unique Australian conditions as to why this has happened here. Our political culture is um, quite young, 250 years old after uh, European settlement. Uh, our political culture is quite thin um, and our political culture relies on political parties. We, all of, this, all of us in this room, um, or many of us in this room I think, including myself, have tended to rely too much on political parties to defend our freedom. I've been a member of the Liberal Party for 35 years and the Liberal Party does many good things, but it does not defend freedom. It is a political organisation designed to elect members to parliament. It is not a cultural phenomena. 
and we have to understand the Labor Party and the left is a cultural phenomenon. The Labor Party, more so than the Liberal Party, has a cultural purpose. The Greens have a cultural purpose. The Liberal Party does not. The Liberal Party is a pragmatic party that has had many successes, but it does not understand culture. And I am constantly frustrated when I talk to my um, friends and colleagues in the Liberal Party, and of course I explain that politics is downstream from culture. Um, and they say, no, 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 no. We don't want to fight the culture wars and let's just stick to economics. <laughs> but of course, this is the problem. And the Liberals have lost the economics battle because of our cultural conflicts, our culture now whereby we accept the growth of the state, we accept uh, the role of the state in our families. Uh, has meant that the Liberals have completely abrogated that field. Um, and I'm frustrated so deeply when uh, the latest solution to the Liberal Party's problem seems to be, oh, well, only if we, have, if we have young people engaged in home ownership, young people will start to vote for us. Well, they'll still uh, own a home but still vote Green, and that is a program that will take 20 or 30 years. It will take a generation to change. And part of the problem that the Liberal Party has is that it doesn't take education seriously. So again, in my role at the IPA, fighting for Bill Leake, fighting for Peter Ridd, the professor sacked for expressing his views on, on climate change, fighting for Andrew Bolt, fighting for Israel Folau, and I was involved in the Israel Folau case. The Liberal Party was nowhere to be seen on any one of those issues. There were one or two um, uh, members, MPs, who stood up, but they were the dissidents. Craig Kelly, George Christensen, Alex Antich, Jared, Ren Jared Rennick, who, by the way, you might have seen as a Queensland senator who lost his uh, pre-selection for a Senate spot yesterday. It was the dissidents who stood up for freedom. When Zoe Bueller, uh, and I got to know Zoe, we organised her legal defence. Zoe Bueller was the, the uh, mother arrested in her pajamas in Ballarat in front of her screaming children in her living room by four um, black uniformed police. It was Craig Kelly who rang me up at 9pm that night, I think it was a Wednesday, and he said, uh, John, have you, he's a friend of mine, he said, have you seen this video? No, I haven't seen the video, I've been with the kids. And he sent me this video and I couldn't believe it was happening in Australia. Yeah. I couldn't believe this was my country. Yeah. I couldn't believe this was the country that my mother fled from Poland to this country for. Um, and within a couple of hours, we were able to get legal support for Zoe. I got hold of Zoe's mum, Shirley, the next morning. Uh, and I said to Shirley, we're going to fight this, and Shirley burst into tears, and she said, I thought we were all alone, and I said, you're not. Not a Liberal, not a Liberal stood up for Zoe. Not a single Liberal. Um, Andrew Thorburn, uh, as a Christian, uh, he was at the NAB Bank. Uh, as you know, uh, he took on the role of CEO of Essendon Football Club in Melbourne uh, for about, what was it? Two days, three days, uh, forced to resign because he had mainstream Christian values. I have nothing against Simon Birmingham, but when Simon Birmingham was interviewed on the ABC radio the day after Thorburn was required to resign and he was asked, uh, do you have a view? He said, no, I don't. I don't, ha well, I'm now paraphrasing. He, he said, basically, I don't have a view on a Christian being forced from a job in Australia in 2023 because of their Christian views. We can't rely on political parties. They are there for different purposes, different aims. It is up to us as a movement, as a group of people, as Kevin said, 
all lighting our own fires. So when I think about then how do we begin our cultural renaissance, our renewal, as I said, we're not taking back the institutions anytime soon. Uh, we're not taking back our political parties anytime soon. As, as I said, in relation to the Liberal Party, uh, it was established for a different purpose. What we can do is we can operate on a small scale, on an achievable scale. We can do things that we ourselves can control that doesn't require the agency of politicians or of public servants or of the media. It's things we can do ourselves that don't rely on others. Certainly we might sometimes need to get permission, we might need to get regulatory approval, we might need to dodge some red tape sometimes, but the idea, as much as I would like to see the ABC sold tomorrow, <laughs> that selling the ABC will fix our problems, uh, that somehow there will be a uh, quadrant placed in the library of every school, um, isn't going to happen. Um, our future is our own institution, our future is classical education, our future is not one Campion College, it is a hundred Campion Colleges around Australia. Um, and this then comes to uh, a key point, which is why, as I said, we've devolved towards education. Education is not only the key uh, to human flourishing, but it is also um, the key family relationship beyond faith. It is then education. And when I look at the things and the areas that we can make a difference in, where we can control our destiny, it is in education. Through our schools, through our learning, through home education, uh, through reading, with our children together. These are the things that the state hasn't yet grabbed. The state, of course, does want to grab it. Uh, and we know that the family is the last bastion, but, or the only bastion. Well, the family and the church, or religion, or faith is the, uh, are the only bastions between the state and the individual. They want to grab education, but we can't let them. So, as I said, um, from my background working in education, let me then demonstrate some of the challenges that we face in education and why it is upon us um, to fix and take control of education again. So not only have we lost our cultural heritage, um, but in education's own terms, in the own terms of ACARA, of the education ministers, our education reforms have been absolutely failing. So for example, the Productivity Commission identified that the Coalition's $320 billion commitment for what's called the Gonski 2.0 program um, uh, has uh, not produced any measurable improvements. In fact, there are now more students failing to meet basic literally, literacy standards. Now there's 90,000 young Australians who don't meet the basic NAPLAN minimum standards. School attendance, and this is before COVID, um, has fallen by 4% for students in years 7 to 10. Um, our uh, achievement in mathematics continues to fall so that we are now um, 24, so an average uh, student in year 10 is 18 months behind in mathematics were they, where they were some 10 years ago. So these are the challenges we face. Um, knowing these challenges, what is interesting is that, and this was referred to earlier today, uh, enrolment in non-government schools continues to increase, notwithstanding the massive cost of pressures, living, cost of, uh, uh, living pressures that families face. And so while enrolment in government schools decline, in non-government schools, enrolments have surged by 12% in the five years to 2022. So uh, education is identified not only by us as absolutely key to the future, but it's identified so by parents. 
parents want to have control over education. They know it's the key to learning um, their children to to learning and their children's future. Um, when I was at the Menzies Research Centre, I mentioned that I'd worked with Professor Brian Caldwell, um, and we developed um, plans for a voucher system uh, to give parents more control over education, uh, to provide equity in education, whereby a uh, son or daughter of a millionaire in a government school is not getting a free education uh, when people on much lesser incomes are making huge sacrifices for non-government school education. Um, a vou vouchers and derivatives of vouchers have provided huge improvements uh, in, in the US, uh, in various states. But when the proposal for vouchers and more parent control um, was then uh, put to the education minister, uh, then Dr Brendan Nelson. Um, Brendan's comments were, which in the years past he somewhat walked back from, um, but they reflected the Liberal Party's views. Um, what is in the document, i.e. vouchers, these ideas are not government policy and will not be government policy as long as I have the privilege to be the Minister. This is what we face. Over the um, uh, nine and a half, eight and a half years of the Abbott, Turnbull, Morrison government. The Liberal <laughs> Party took education so seriously. There were five education ministers in eight and a half years. These are the challenges that we face. But when we look, for example, at the United States, uh, and you'd be familiar with the um, uh, success of Governor Youngkin, Glenn Youngkin in Virginia, we have seen that not only is education important culturally, it is important politically, it is a political success story for the Republicans. So again, um, as was reported when Glenn Youngkin won the governorship of um, California, oh, of uh, Virginia, he, he, if only it was California. Um, as was reported at the time, um, he, uh, tapped into the deep concern that parents had about the direction of education uh, in that state. The 54-year-old Youngkin's defeat of Democrat Terry McAuliffe marked a sharp turnaround in a state that had shifted left over the past decade. And Youngkin didn't only get elected on education, he practised on education. So he launched his tenure as Virginia's 74th governor uh, in the weekend after he was inaugurated with three executive orders devoted to education. Imagine a state government, imagine a federal government, Labor or Liberal, making education its number one priority on the weekend after the election. Uh, it was a level of focus on schools that was unprecedented in recent memory. Youngkin's first order forbade the teaching of inherently divisive concepts, including critical race theory, an academic framework that examines how policies and laws perpetuate systemic racism in the United States. He did that immediately, and of course, uh, the debate in uh, the US on education has been dramatically changed as Republicans have understood how deeply parents care about education. So let's compare that to Australia. And I won't pick on Julie Bishop, um, but she is an example of what not to do. So Julie Bishop, of course, um, was education minister at the end of the Howard government. And I use this just as an example of the thinking not only of liberal um, ministers, but also of some thoughtful Labor MPs too. Uh, and it's an example of the thinking that we have to overcome. So as an education minister in 2006, um, she said that uh, then a national curriculum, uh, as was being developed, and of course the national curriculum ha had its predecessor in coalition government, uh, was designed, she wanted a curriculum to overcome the influence of ideologues and teacher unions who she argued had too strong an influence over state education departments, again, not unreasonably. Um, she said 
um, that the failure of state governments to protect the interests of young Australians from trendy educational fads has led the community turning to the federal government to take action. So, what was the Liberals' proposal to overcome the ideologues of state governments? Hand education to the ideologues of the federal government. She said, we need to take school curriculum out of the hands of the ideologue ideologues in state and territory education bureaucracies and give it, I'd say, to a national board of studies comprising the sensible centre of educators. A common model curriculum would, by virtue of it being on the national stage, result in curriculum being made more accountable through greater public scrutiny at the bar of public opinion. This would result in greater community confidence in education. So my argument is, of course, that education is so contested, it is so important, there is no sensible centre. There isn't. Education will always be contested. And the argument that if only we had sensible educators, not radical ideologues writing education, then things would be better, I think, completely misunderstands the role of culture and it misunderstands the role of education. So I want to just, in the final few moments, give you an example. Some of you might have heard me talk about this example before, but I think it goes to so many things I can't help using it. Um, an example of the type of sensible centre educator that Julie Bishop, as a typical Liberal MP, wanted to hand education over to. And uh, when I say this, Kevin, I'm sure will start smiling. Um, she handed over the writing of the history part of the national curriculum to Professor Tony Taylor. There's a couple of laughs. Um, Professor Tony Taylor um, was uh, academic at Monash University. He had been employed by both Labor and Liberal governments to write um, history curriculum. Um, in the terms of the profession, um, he was very well credentialed. He'd worked on uh, many, many programs and he was the go-to historian of choice for a Liberal government. When in 2011, as the Shadow Education Minister Christopher Pine said that the national curriculum should perhaps make reference to the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights and the English Civil War, Tony Taylor, the, as I said, the go-to person for Liberal politicians writing uh, curriculum, uh, responded. He said as following, there is no reason to study the English Civil War because it is arguably just a series of confused and confusing localised squabbles that may have had a special significance for UK history, but for anybody else, unless they like dressing up in period costume, they have none. I then wrote to every federal MP in my capacity as Executive Director of the IPA, uh, having spent two days rummaging through Churchill, rummaging through Paul Johnson, rummaging, th rummaging through even the Marxist historian Christopher Hill, who said he believed that the English Civil War was so great an intellectual revolution that it is difficult for us to conceive how men thought before it was made. The English Civil War gave us our modern idea of parliamentary democracy, of control of an overmighty executive or control over an overmighty king. It gave us the democracy that we are so lucky to live in at the moment. But for the person charged by a Liberal politician to write the curriculum, the English Civil War had so little relevance. That is why we must take matters into our own hands. Um, and I've written up the paper and um, it'll be available after this, but I go through the examples of the Ramsey Foundation and the response of Sydney University academics to proposals for the teaching of Western civilisation at the University of Sydney. I go through proposals of the Abbott government to give funding to the University of Western Australia for Bjorn Lomborg to come and start a consensus centre. 
And um, he was rejected and in the end the Abbott government, and I've said this to Tony Abbott and he's a senior fellow at the IPA and, and Tony has recognised uh, the, the error of his ways. Uh, the federal government um, withdrew their offer of funding of $5 million to UWA for the Bjorn Long World Consensus Centre and I think that was a mistake. He should have done two things. He should have then increased the offer of funding to $50 million and said to UWA, well, if you don't need $5 million, I'll take $5 million off your funding. Um, but uh, what strikes me about uh, the rejection of the Bjorn Lomborg offer, and again, this demonstrates why I think um, universities can't be saved. Um, Bjorn Lomborg was rejected and his centre was rejected at UWA by its academics, not because he was a climate change sceptic. He was rejected, and this is again in the terms of the academic's own words, he was rejected because he's a climate change contrarian. And The Guardian helpfully explained what a climate change contrarian was, which was, it is not a denialist, but it is simply someone who says things that infuriate those who believe climate change is the, is the world's most serious crisis. That is how far our universities have been lost. So, um, David, congratulations on a wonderful discussion today. Thank you for the opportunity um, to give my thoughts on some of the challenges that we face ahead. I think they are very great challenges indeed, um, but I'm also optimistic about the future because you can tell from the enthusiasm of the people in this room that we want a better future and for our children. And I can also say, as um, uh, with my IPA hat on as someone, we now have something like 2,000 uh, young IPA members. Um, you might argue those over 18 are already lost. 18 to 25 are already lost. But those under 18 are not. Every revolution has a counter revolution and people understand and young people especially young boys understand what they are missing out on and and i'll finish this but I, I talked about the liberal party i'll i'll finish um my discussion today by making a reference to what happened on election night in victoria in november last year so as i said the liberals are reduced to 18 out of 88 seats um, they realise they have an existential crisis with young people um, and uh, they struggle with how to communicate to young people. About a kilometre down the road from where the Liberal Party uh, is drowning in their sorrows, having lost the votes of young people, having lost the votes of women, having lost the votes of tradies, having lost the votes of nearly everyone, <laughs> Jordan Peterson was speaking at the National Tennis Centre. 8,000 people sold out. 80% of the audience was under the age of 35. The same night. So there is hope, there is a future, and the future is in education. Thank you.